This video is about state repression and human rights abuses in the DPRK. It explains how state repression works in concert with the political system, official ideology and the economic system, all of which we've covered in other videos. And it works together with these things to enforce the centralized power and control of the Kim dynasty. Now, warning before we get into this, some of the material in this video may be confronting. So if you have a personal history of trauma, or if you've got lived or family experience of living under an authoritarian regime, please do tread lightly with this topic. I understand completely if this brings up discomfort and you've got my full support and let me know if you need any further assistance. We cover a lot of ground in this video. I'll start out by asking whether North Korea is a totalitarian state. And then to answer that question, we'll look at the country's social control mechanisms and punishment system. We'll have a look at the people who flee North Korea to escape repression. And then we'll come to the UN Commission of Inquiry report from 2014 on the DPRK and the concept of responsibility to protect in the North Korean context. We'll look at the human rights and humanitarian discourses. And then we'll finish by asking another important question of whether external pressure or change from within is the way to improve the human rights situation in the DPRK. Russian academic Andrei Lankov has argued that the DPRK during the Kim Il-sung era was the closest approximation of a pure totalitarian state that the world has ever seen. Now, the word totalitarianism gets thrown around a lot and often with quite a bit of hyperbole. So what then does it actually mean? What is a totalitarian state? Totalitarianism is a system of dictatorial rule in which the dictator pursues total control over their polity with the aid of modern technology. This level of total control was only made possible during the 20th century through the technological advancements in communications, transportation and weaponry technologies, which provided the conditions for pervasive physical terror mass indoctrination and the dissemination of the ideology of the totalitarian movement. In a classic typology of totalitarian regimes, based on analyses of the communist and fascist regimes of the early 20th century, Karl Friedrich and Zbigniew Brzezinski identified a group of mutually reinforcing characteristics that define totalitarian states. So let's list them off. First, Totalitarian states are led by an absolute dictator with the backing of a mass party. Second, a totalitarian state has a utopian transformational ideology that legitimizes the rule of the dictator and the mass party, which is usually based on a rejection of previous legitimating frameworks. Third, the dictator and the party maintain a centrally planned economy and maintain tight centralized control over all facets of economic activity. Fourth, the dictator and the ruling oligarchy similarly, similarly maintain complete control over the coercive institutions and armed forces of the state. So these elements relate to the architecture of the state, its institutions and centralized relationship to the leader. And we've explored this specific architecture in North Korea in previous videos. Of interest to us in this video are Friedrich and Brzezinski's other two characteristics of totalitarian states. So first, the dictator and the ruling oligarchy maintain absolute control through an all-pervasive terror, using mechanisms like secret police organizations, the penetration of secret operatives into all institutions, and extreme social pressure. Also, the party exerts monopoly control over media technology, which it uses for mass communication of the party's ideology and the insinuation of a psychological terror. It's these manifestations of the state institutional architecture of centralized control that are the focus of the human rights discourses on North Korea. Totalitarian regimes rely on creating a system of terror to preserve, or maybe strong arm is a better word for it, strong arm the loyalty of their citizens. 
Organised supervision and violence take place not only against the public, but also members of the bureaucracy and even members of the elite. So everyone is subjected to this system of terror. And this is necessary because the world portrayed by the official ideology and official propaganda is really a fictitious world. And the people need to be protected from reality so that they maintain their faith in this fiction. Hannah Arendt, the great political philosopher and Holocaust survivor, has argued that physical terror is most effective when the citizens begin to fear the consequences of leaving this movement altogether and feeling more secure as members of the movement than they would as outsiders, even if this makes them complicit in reprehensible crimes. In the North Korean case, we do see a clear architecture of a system of terror whose purpose is to atomize the individual and diminish their social bonds with the people around them so that they can only see their salvation as coming from the leader and coming from the state. You recall the Songbun class system from our video on North Korea's political system, which divides the North Korean people into three broad categories, the core class, the wavering class and the hostile class. Now, while all North Koreans are exposed to surveillance and coercion, the Songbun system shapes the depth and intensity of that exposure, which depends on where people sit within the Songbun hierarchy. Another important component of control is to keep people fixed in one place. North Korean citizens generally live in apartment complexes in urban areas or in residential compounds close to where they work. The picture at the bottom of the slide here, this illustrates a, a DPRK citizen registration card, which has been issued to someone by the Ministry of Public Security. And this citizen registration, this is the documentary basis for residential and travel restrictions. Freedom of relocation is strictly limited, as people are prohibited from changing jobs or from moving to new locations without official permission. So you can't just move around uh, at a whim, you need official permission to do this. A travel pass granted by the Ministry of Public Security, that's what's traditionally needed to travel outside one's home district. And it takes a long time to get one of these, and it's usually only granted for official business or important family functions. Any person staying at a dwelling other than their home is required to register with a local official, on arrival, they have to present their identification papers, so present the document that you can see here, and explain the reason for their visit and get written permission authorising their stay. So it's quite an onerous process. Also, in the past, food that was distributed by the state through the public distribution system was not available to people travelling outside of their home district. Though this control has lost some of its power since the rise of the Jiangmudang markets. The tentacles of official surveillance extend all the way down to the community level to units called People's Neighbourhood Teams, or Inminban. Now, the Inminban were the basic social cell of state control within at the household level, and this linked families and households to the Korean Workers' Party's extensive bureaucratic network. Now, note here that the Inminban are a distinct organisational unit from party cells which are more to do with the workplace and other party organisations. The local leader of the Inminban is a person called the Inminban Jang. And this person would manage political control and ideological mobilisation within the local unit, which consists of about 20 to 50 households. The Inminban Jang keeps track of people's movements within their jurisdiction, and they've got the power to inspect any household at any time. Now, it's important to note also that the Inmin Bunjang is a really tough position. Any misdemeanors or crimes committed by people under their jurisdiction not only mean dire consequences for the perpetrator of those crimes, but also for the Inmin Bunjang as well. Things become even more insidious when we look at social control at the individual level. And this is where we see ritualized self-criticism come into play or the, what, what are known as struggle sessions. We can tease out the general pattern of these rituals of self-criticism from the testimony of North Korean defectors, 
and also from a small group of Americans who defected to North Korea during the Cold War, but have since come out and written about their experiences. Also, similar self-criticism rituals were practiced across the communist bloc. Now, this is how self-criticism works. Let's walk through the process. Self-criticism sessions in person were usually conducted once a week, either in party cells, work groups, or in the Inminbun. Long and more detailed written self-criticism documents were also required to be submitted by people once per month. What about what happens during these weekly meetings? Well, first off, an individual person begins by standing to attention, and then they recite word for word one of the teachings of Kim Il-sung. Once they've done that, they then list their failings or sins from the previous week. They express regret for these trans transgressions, and then they list ways that their future conduct will better reflect the teachings of the great leader. So up to this point, it's kind of like uh, Catholic repentance, uh, similar kind of ritual to that, but it gets more insidious here. So at this point, once the individual's given their confession, the presiding party official decides if their self-criticism has been satisfactory. So if they deem that it has, then the individual will go on to criticize other people in the group. So the other peers in the room. If the party official decides that the self-criticism is unsatisfactory, then other group members are ordered to expand on the person's self-criticism. If a specific self-criticism is deemed sufficiently serious, the party official would then call out the individual for a special session. Now, self-criticism meetings generally focus on minor or unimportant transgressions. However, their value as a method of social control lies in deterring individuals from engaging in any kind of risky behaviours for which they might be discovered and criticised. And in these cases, the criticisms become more intense and the punishments become more severe. Any behaviour that was too perilous to confess was therefore too dangerous to risk. This process produces a psychological climate which deters people from engaging in subversive or antisocial behaviour for their own self-preservation, because these rituals are quite demanding. Self-criticism rituals illustrate something very important about authoritarian political systems. And that's that free initiative and free thought in any field or any kind of activity that's not entirely predictable to the state can be interpreted as a threat to the exercise of centralised authoritarian power. So an extreme manifestation of this is the persecution of intellectuals. So in North Korea, the persecution of intellectuals was an inevitable outgrowth of the state's quest for total control. If we go back to the Kim Il-sung era, many intellectuals were purged, incarcerated or put to death. In more recent times, North Korea's intellectuals know what the political red lines are and they self-censor accordingly. Repression of thought is integral to career advancement. So the prospect of career advancement, particularly for members of the party or bureaucrats in the state institutions, their career advancement prospects work as both a carrot and a stick in acculturating them into appropriate behavior. But this comes at a cost. Repression of thought has a flip side. The enforced uniformity and the savaging of intellectual talent might produce devoted ideologues and it might produce compliant bureaucrats. However, it leaves the country vulnerable when complex problems arise that require creative adaptations and new ideas. And that's because officials throughout the institutions of the state are only able to apply rigid ideo ideological dogma and are highly resistant to new ideas. So when you need new ideas, you're not able to generate them. You're not able to do something different. And this can be highly problematic, as we saw during the arduous March period.
Repression of thought is also the logic behind the state's communication monopoly and media restrictions. At their core, the intent is to reduce the possibility of the penetration of ideas that might induce or amplify cognitive dissonance among the people. When the people confront the difference between their lived experiences and the official messaging of the state. Communications restrictions also make it harder for people to connect with each other, which diminishes the risk of organised popular mobilisation against the state. As we've seen in previous weeks, official ideology is like a quasi-religion in which the leader is positioned as a god. Now, this doesn't leave room for more standard religious practice, because this would split the loyalty of the people between the Kims and their God, and there can only be one God, right? But on a more practical level, religions are suppressed to prevent them from becoming rallying rallying points for collective organisation against the state. The North Korean government is also well aware that Christian groups from South Korea and the US are heavily involved in the human rights discourse, and are actively helping North Koreans escape the country through China. Interestingly though, the government does maintain a few officially sanctioned religious sites, like the Catholic church that's depicted here in Pyongyang. There's also a Buddhist monastery in the mountains outside Chongjin. Now both of these sites are itinerary stops for tour groups of foreigners, and there's some debate about the authenticity of these sites. I've been to both of them in my travels to the DPRK, and I share those doubts, particularly given the extensive documented evidence of severe punishments for North Koreans who are connected with Christian organizations. Religious persecution is one manifestation that illustrates the centrality of official enemies of the state in North Korean ideology and of the identification of the in-group in North Korean society, as well as the designated official enemies, both of which are reinforced through the Songbun system. The heavy emphasis on stoking fear of threats from both outside and within is a powerful moderator of the behavior of individuals. The people within North Korean society who can't conform or don't conform to the template of acceptable behavior and loyalty are easily labelled as imperial sympathisers, for whom the most extreme punishments would apply. These punishments can include removal from official positions, it can include re-education through incarceration, or even execution. Now, all of these things collectively fall under the label of purging. Purges are a key element of social control in authoritarian political systems. They serve a number of functions. The implied threat of coercive terror as embodied through the purge is intended as a powerful deterrent against people stepping out of line. Purges can be used as a way of removing underlings who become too powerful, like Kim Jong-un's uncle, Chang Song-tek, pictured in the top left, who was executed in 2013. Individuals can also be scapegoated for the failures of the state, So officials like Kim Wong Hong, pictured on the top right, who was the former Minister of State Security, who was removed from office in 2017. We can also look at someone like Kim Jong Nam, pictured on the bottom left. This is Kim Jong Un's older brother, and he was assassinated in Malaysia in 2017 because he posed a potential threat as an alternative ruler. Purges are also a way for the leader to refresh the upper ranks of the regime elite when a change of policy direction is announced, or to buy the loyalty of junior officials by promoting younger cadres who owe their promotions to the leader. But it's not just individuals who are at risk of coercive punishment. The North Korean government practices collective punishment, So that's where an entire family or friend group of an individual who's been arrested for crimes can be incarcerated in prison camps. And the intention here is to weed out any ideological impurity and to deter others from engaging in anti-regime behavior. So this is an extremely harsh measure. If we come back to the great political theorist, Hannah Arendt, she explained the controlling logic of collective punishment. 
As soon as a person is accused of crimes against the state, their friends and family transform immediately into bitter denunciators in order to save themselves. They'll volunteer information to corroborate the official evidence against the accused, and they'll do this as a way to prove their loyalty and to prove their trustworthiness to the regime. Therefore, for personal safety, individuals tend to avoid intimate contacts to reduce their risk of being denounced by the people around them. So for Hannah Arendt, the process of collective punishment is integral to the atomization of the individual through the destruction of all social bonds except for those between the individual and the state. Of course, when we talk about purges and punishment, we have to talk about North Korea's extensive gulag system. The French historian Pierre Rigolo has identified five different types of prison complex within this system, and I'll introduce them here from the least to the most extreme. So at the lower end, there are transit facilities called help posts, and these house inmates who are awaiting trial for minor political and non-political crimes. Second, there are work regeneration centres in all major cities and towns, and these house people who've been labelled as ineffective, antisocial or lazy, and they're often held without trial or for any specific offence. Hard labour camps are the next rung up. So these are scattered throughout the country and hold about 500 to 2,000 inmates each. And these, the inmates here are people who've been held on the accusation of crimes such as theft or murder or rape, as well as the children of political prisoners, captured defectors and minor political prisoners. So that's part of that collective punishment system. Fourth, where it gets a bit more hardcore, there are deportation zones, and these hold tens of thousands of people under house arrest in remote regions. The people held here are, quote unquote, untrustworthy elements, and these include former landowners and people with relatives who have defected to South Korea. And finally, there are facilities called special dictatorship zones and these are located in the inaccessible mountain regions in the north of the country and you can see these illustrated on the map here so these are the full-fledged concentration camps for political prisoners and these house 150 to 200,000 people which is approximately one percent of the north korean population in these camps, prisoners are forced to perform extremely hard labour, working 12 to 18 hour days while subsisting on poor food or sometimes no food at all. And of course, the mortality rate in these camps is really high. There's torture and there's sexual violence. This is very common. So this is a extraordinarily difficult places to be. Uh, and these special dictatorship zones, these concentration camps have been well documented in uh, some of the books written by defectors who've managed to escape. The important takeaway from this analysis is that the totalitarian aspect of these social control and punishment measures comes not just from each of these things as something that's terrible individually, but it comes from how they operate together as an integrated system of terror in which they mutually reinforce each other with the goal of centralised control. Now, obviously, this is a horrible system, but there's not many viable options available for North Koreans who can no longer take existing within this system. But one coping strategy that some people do choose is to escape the country altogether. But it's not easy to flee North Korea. The border to, to South Korea is essentially impassable because of the DMZ, which is highly fortified. So this is not a frontier that you can just cruise across easily. There's no boat people phenomenon. So there's no maritime asylum seeker flows as we might see in the Mediterranean or in Southeast Asia. So the only way out is by land through China. So to cross into China, the primary route for people fleeing North Korea is crossing the Tumen River into the Yanbian Korean Autonomous Prefecture in China's Jilin province. The first reason that this is the main route of escape 
is one geographic. So the Tumen River is much easier to cross than the Yalu River border with China. And you can see clearly why here. If we look at the photos on the slide, the photos on the left depict the Yalu River, which is very wide and very deep. The pics on the right illustrate the Tumen River, which is much narrower and, and very shallow, and you can walk or wade through the river. And it's even easier in the winter when it's frozen over. The second explanation for this escape route over the Tumen River to Yanbian is because Yanbian is where the help is. Yanbian has a high ethnic Korean population. So there's often people have family connections, but in the absence of that, there's the linguistic and cultural familiarity of having lots of Korean people on the Chinese side of the border. The capital of Yanbian is a small city called Yanji. And in Yanji, there's a number of clandestine organizations working to help North Korean escapees get to South Korea. Now to do that, they either have to go overland through China and into Southeast Asia. And then once they get to Bangkok, they go to the South Korean embassy uh, who then facilitate them to fly to South Korea. Or they do something similar, but they go overland to Mongolia and then fly to South Korea that way. There's also an interesting story in who can flee North Korea. So if we look at this data from the South Korean Ministry of Unification, it shows that North Korean defectors who are, end up arriving in South Korea overwhelmingly originate from the provinces closest to the Chinese border. So that's North Hamgyong, South Hamgyong and Yangang. And this is because official travel restrictions make it really hard for people to travel across North Korea in order to get to the border to escape. Also, the mountainous geography creates transportation bottlenecks and prevents masses of people escaping on foot. We can also see from this graph that the North Koreans who make it to South Korea are overwhelmingly female. And this reflects the greater capacity for women to accumulate foreign currency savings in the North through entrepreneurial activity. Getting out of North Korea is also not necessarily cheap. You need to bribe border guards. And once you get to Yanbian, you also need to pay for help in order to facilitate uh, your transit out of China. So those who get out, make it into China, but don't have any money when they get there, they're liable to get stuck and are extremely vulnerable to exploitation. But let's reflect for a moment on this term defector and what it means. So the term defector refers to switching political allegiances. And that made sense in the context of the Korean War, in the context of Koreans switching sides. But in other contexts, we'd label people fleeing persecution as refugees. So why isn't the word refugee used more commonly in relation to people who flee North Korea? Well, for one, North Korean escapees are not officially refugees under the refugee convention definition because they don't have to seek asylum elsewhere. They have a guaranteed right to citizenship in South Korea if they can make it there. As the graphic here from NK News illustrates, People's reasons for defecting to the South are also wide ranging. So not everyone that gets out of North Korea would qualify as a refugee under the UN definition of the term either. North Korean defectors are a significant source of information about the human rights situation in North Korea. So the illustrated graphics that you've seen throughout this video, these have been based on the testimony of defectors. And the experiences of these people are truly harrowing. You can see this in the drawings. But I also want to present an important caveat. And this is to be aware of the commercialization of defector stories. Now, while it's entirely appropriate for North Korean escapees to publish their stories and to be compensated for doing so, it's another thing to maintain this role as an ongoing profession. So to be an ongoing media figure as a defector, it requires you to continually churn out new content to stay relevant in the media landscape in the US and South Korea. And this is where it gets murky because in the effort to create new content, that new content is not always as reliable as the first published memoirs.
Now, I want to stress that this is more of an indictment of the lack of economic the lack of economic opportunities available for North Korean escapees, along with the economics of the clickbait media ecosystem, than it is of the integrity of escapees themselves. In 2014, the United Nations Human Rights Commission published an extensive report documenting the human rights abuses that have occurred in North Korea. The UN Commission of Inquiry that produced this report was chaired by former Australian High Court Justice Michael Kirby. So in addition to a distinguished legal career in Australia, Kirby has a long record of human rights advocacy across a number of issue areas, including for LGBTQIA plus communities. But note here, it's important that the UN Human Rights Commission is not the same body as the more well-known UN High Commission for Human Rights. I know it's a bit confusing, but they're two distinctly different bodies. The establishment of the UN Commission of Inquiry that produced this report was the culmination of 15 years of civil society pressure from human rights organisations in the US, South Korea and elsewhere. And I'll come back to this in a minute. I've included the full text of the report on LMS, so please do check it out. It is a treasure trove of information on this very important topic. Now, this report was a significant contribution to the human rights discourse. It provided a valuable, systematic, comprehensive catalogue of evidence of human rights abuses in the DPRK. It accused the Kim regime of six main human rights abuses. So these were arbitrary detention and torture, starvation, denial of freedom of thought, denial of freedom of movement, foreign abductions and discrimination. And on this basis, the report then went on to accuse the North Korean government of committing crimes against humanity as defined in international law under Article 7 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And it subsequently recommended that the UN Security Council refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court for prosecution. Significant among the report's recommendations on the basis of its findings of crimes against humanity are that the international community must accept its responsibility to protect the people of North Korea from the Kim regime. So this responsibility to protect, this is an important legal doctrine. So responsibility to protect, or R2P for short, is a set of principles that were, that were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2005, and then since reaffirmed in a few resolutions in the UN Security Council. Now this emerged from the failure of the international community to adequately respond to the atrocities that were committed in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. R2P rests on three important principles. So first is that every state has a responsibility to protect its own population from genocide, ethnic cleansing and war crimes by neither perpetrating them nor tolerating them. The second principle is that every state in the international community has the obligation to assist other states in meeting their individual responsibility to protect. And third, should a state fail to meet that responsibility to its own people, it's the responsibility of the wider international community to take collective action to intervene on behalf of the people of that state including using military force if necessary. So in the North Korean case, the UN Commission of Inquiry argued that since there was clear evidence of crimes against humanity being committed by the North Korean government against its people, R2P principles did apply. But as we know, the UN Security Council referral never took place. It was clear that China and Russia would veto any resolution to this effect, which killed off any potential prosecution in the ICC. International criminal court prosecution cannot proceed without authorization through a resolution from the UN Security Council. 
But let's say even if ICC prosecution had been authorised by the Security Council, the North Korean government doesn't recognise the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And there's no other legal mechanisms in existence in international law that could enforce the indictment of a sitting leader whose country doesn't recognise the ICC. Similarly, a UN Security Council resolution would be required to authorise any international military intervention to enforce responsibility to protect, which China and Russia would also obviously veto. So in the context of authorising responsibility to protect and ICC prosecution, the UN Commission of Inquiry report was a failure. But in the context of the blockage in the UN Security Council, what the UN Commission of Inquiry report does do is establish an inventory of the Kim regime's crimes that can be used as evidence to prosecute high-ranking officials in the ICC, but only in the event that the current government falls. And there are past examples of this from other contexts. So in Iraq and the former Yugoslavia, High-level officials were charged with crimes against humanity, uh, but that had to happen once those regimes had been removed or fell apart. Until they lose power, they're essentially untouchable. In the R2P debate, we also need to be sober and realistic about the difficulties of military intervention against North Korea. Even if the UN Security Council had authorised an R2P intervention in North Korea, the risks of such an intervention are prohib prohibitively high. Studies of the potential impacts of war against North Korea estimate casualties of up to 500,000 people at a cost of more than one trillion US dollars. Now, my view is that it's disingenuous to argue for protecting the human rights of North Korean citizens by risking the lives of millions of North Koreans on both sides of the DMZ through international military intervention. The Korean War of 1950 to 53 was a calamity. A Korean War 2.0 could be even worse. Now what this illustrates is, this is a terrible situation all around in which there are no good options. There's no easy solves. So if R2P is off the table, where does that leave the international community in its response to the suffering of the North Korean people? Well, there are two major constituencies internationally that drive activism on the plight of the North Korean people and the crimes of the Kim regime. So these are the humanitarian community and the human rights community. And both of these communities started exercising agency in the DPRK during the arduous march, during the time of the famine. So hum at this time, the humanitarian agencies launched an effort to stem the famine. So these are the people who are doing what they can to negotiate with the North Korean government to bring food into the country, to feed people, to satisfy the immediate survival needs of people on the ground. Human rights organisations, meanwhile, played a pivotal role in exposing North Korea's record, record of human rights abuses, and that effort culminated in the UN Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry report. It's surprising, these communities are not natural allies. And this is put well by Eric Weingartner in his article from 38 North, and you can read the quote where he describes that here. This graphic illustrates how the humanitarian and human rights constituencies diverge. But to broadly summarise, the humanitarian impulse is to address the immediate survival needs of the North Korean people, even where that necessitates working with the Kim government to negotiate access. While a human rights perspective sees transformational change of the North Korean political system as the only road to ending the suffering of the North Korean people. Understanding these two perspectives is critical to understanding the politicisation of international approaches to dealing with North Korea. So let's come back now full circle to our original discussion premise for this video. Is totalitarianism necessarily the most fruitful way of understanding the North Korean regime? 
And does that framing lead us to miss the organic changes that are already underway in North Korean society? Is totalitarianism as a framing part of the trap of seeing the North Korean state as a monolithic structure instead of as a dynamic system? So as we've seen, the marketization of the North Korean economy has significantly transformed the relationship between many North Korean people and the state, and it's weakened the state's apparatus of total control. So in the, in the literature, American scholar Charles Armstrong disagrees with the totalitarian label for North Korea. He suggested that a totalitarian explanation overstates the degree of power that the regime actually wields. And it doesn't account for the gap between the rhetoric of total control in official propaganda and the reality in which citizens have developed all kinds of adaptive avoidance and manipulative strategies to get around social control mechanisms. Let's come back to Friedrich and Brzezinski's characteristics of totalitarian regimes. And in addressing this, we have to ask, can we still say that Kim Jong-un and the North Korean government exercise total control? Well, Kim Jong-un's position as the absolute dictator is much less secure than was Kim Il-sung's prior to the arduous march. Though the Workers' Party of Korea does remain highly penetrated across North Korean society. The centrally coordinated command economy has given way to a more decentralized market economy, weakening the state's economic controls over the people. People's adherence to the official ideology is largely performative. After the arduous march and now through the COVID pandemic, one would be hard pressed to find many true believers on the ground. The communications blockade has well and truly been breached by current day communications technologies and the North Korean people are very aware of the prosperity of people in neighboring countries. What remains strong are the state's coercive institutions, but surveillance and punishment are less effective when the state has lost power in these other areas of the control matrix. North Korea has changed significantly since the arduous march, and the where and the how of this change is important to identifying leverage points for the international community to try and impact change for the North Korean people. And with that in mind, a securitized response is not necessarily the only response available. In the absence of a credible big stick, Fostering evolutionary social change might present another option to improve the human rights situation. This topic raises a number of difficult questions that are applicable more broadly in debates about human rights. Can humanitarian intervention based on R2P be a cover for more hegemonic obje objectives? Can intervention, no matter how well-meaning, make things worse for the people on the ground rather than improve their situation? Does the international community have a right to make decisions about the North Korean people without their input? Is external pressure the best option? Or should we be looking for more organic changes within North Korean society as a driver of change? Now, none of these questions minimizes the gravity of the problems faced by ordinary North Koreans, but they do speak to the difficulties of, of what the international community should do to advance the interests of North Korean people. On another note, the global resurgence of the far right, the increasingly strident authoritarian challenge to liberal democracies, and the pervasiveness of new online surveillance technologies all this compels us to seriously consider the nature of centralized control, to seriously consider the power of ideology and the creation of enemy others and the weaponization of information and anti-intellectualism. The North Korea case prompts us to critically scrutinize the difference between manufactured crises and real legitimate threats. And it prompts us to deeply consider the appropriate powers of the state and how we might respond to arbitrary state power, as well as how we might adapt if the state is forced to retreat. These are all big questions and enormous issues of importance in the current moment. 
As you work on your assessment task for this week's material, these key points may be helpful. Thank you.